the U.S. went to Afghanistan, of course, after 9-11 and the Al-Qaeda attacks. You know, our objective all along has been to try to ensure that Afghanistan remains stable and does not once again become a safe haven for terrorist groups that can attack the U.S. And, and that situation remains the same, and to me that's still the rationale as to why the U.S. should remain engaged in Afghanistan you know, and not repeat the mis mistakes of the past of exiting too quickly and forgetting about Afghanistan because uh, it has a habit of coming back to haunt you. Um, and so for me, the single most important thing for the U.S. now is to make a commitment to re remain engaged in Afghanistan for the longer term, but at more sustainable levels. Um, you know, I think in the past, we were probably trying to do too much in Afghanistan, and I think it's important that we not go from that extreme to the other extreme of doing too little. Right now, I'd give a close to a failing grade to the national unity government, um, but I would have to put that in the context that they were dealt a very difficult hand, uh, which is an agreement that basically created a bit of a two-headed government with the president, uh, President Ghani, and then a chief executive officer, Abdullah, um, and an agreement to share power and share positions, um, which basically set the two groups up to fight. And so the government's largely been um, ineffective, you know, certainly from the perspective of the majority of of Afghans because it's not addressing some of the key challenges that the ordinary Afghans are facing. Instead, there's a perception that the government is basically arguing internally about who's going to get this ministry and who's going to get that ministry. We've always known that when sort of the war and aid economic bubble bursts, uh, it's going to be painful. You know, a very high percentage of Afghans' illicit economy was contracting for the military and for the aid agencies, um, and that has gone down dramatically. I mean, a few years ago, we had 100,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan, and today we have 9,800, and, and, and that's had a major impact on the economy. In addition to that, the deteriorating security situation has uh, discouraged other investors from coming in and investing and many rich Afghans um, are keeping their money offshore uh, because there's not a, a good business climate to bring their money back and invest in Afghanistan. So a number of these factors, the uncertainty of where things are heading, deteriorating security, the political gridlock are, are leading everyone with resources to take a wait and see attitude and the international community at the same time sharply withdrawing uh, resources, um, which has contributed to the sharp downturn of the economy from again averaging you know, eight to nine percent growth rates in the last decade to only about 1.3 percent uh, last year. Um, and that's being felt in terms of, in particular, urban areas where there's high unemployment rates. And, and you're seeing that very tangibly demonstrated with the number of Afghans who are now trying to leave. And the number of passport applications has, has gone up from 3,000 to 8,000 uh, per month in Kabul um, because so many young men in particular are trying to go abroad to earn a livelihood. It's a very confusing time for the peace process right now and a challenging time. There's clearly not a military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. Ultimately, if there is going to be a solution, it has to be an inclusive political process that leads to some kind of um, political agreement. Um, that's not to say there's not a role for the military. I think the military actually play, uh, you know, plays an important role um, as one of the tools in that kind of negotiating process. But the situation is confused now because, for one, um, there was some progress towards a peace process and talks, uh, which then uh, got completely derailed. Uh, when the news that Mullah Omar had been dead for the last couple years e emerged and the set the, you know, led to sort of an internal leadership struggles within the Taliban, which are still not fully resolved. And today we're just hearing the news, even reports uh, still unconfirmed, that the new leader who took over from Mullah Omar, Mullah Mansour, was himself shot uh, in an internal Taliban uh, dispute and was reportedly injured. Um, so it's, again, hard to negotiate with the Taliban when they're still trying to sort out you know, some of their own leadership issues. Uh, it's also difficult for President Ghani because one of the first things he did after becoming elected was uh, reach out to Pakistan with the assumption that he really needs to have peace with Pakistan uh, to get them on board to then use their influence to bring the Taliban to the negotiating table. 
And President Ghani made many compromises and concessions, uh, but there's a strong perception in Afghanistan that he did not get much in return from Pakistan in that regard. Um, and so he lost, he spent a lot of political capital in that peace process effort, which, uh, and now I think is a bit gun shy in terms of going, doing that all over again. My own view is that the situation is too complex and the various groups are too fragmented to have a grand bargain. I think more realistically, you're going to have a series of agreements um, with this faction of the Taliban or that faction of the Taliban. But even getting um, unity of, within the Afghan government is difficult. We have different groups within you know, the Afghan government and, uh, with different views on the peace process. And it's still not completely clear what Pakistan's end objective is in this regard. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, again, confusion, lack of clarity about what the interests of all the different groups are, uh, which certainly lead me to believe that this is going to be a long process, peace process, as most peace processes are. Um, and we should not be expecting, again, a, a grand bargain uh, in, in the short term.